Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. This is a Commodore Max belonging to a friend of mine purchased several years ago from his father in Japan. However, he has never been able to test it, mainly because the Japanese TV system is not compatible with the European one, and funding multi-standard TVs was not cheap or easy. The Ultimax was originally designed as a console for the Japanese market, where the power system and the video format differ from those in Europe. In Japan, the power supply adjusts to a voltage of 100 volts, while in Italy and most of Europe, the power supply is at 220 volts. Additionally, Japan uses the NTSC video system, while Europe had different systems, so I'll make a simple modification that will allow it to work on a regular monitor with an RCA input. The Ultimax uses a chip called V2 to generate separate video signals for chrominance and luminance. These signals need to be converted into a format that a regular TV can understand through DRF modulators. This combines the video signal and the audio, transforming them into a signal that can be transmitted to a television. Now, looking at the back of the Ultimax, you can see that it has a stereo audio jack. However, the seed in the Ultimax produces only a mono signal. Only one channel is connected, while the other one is unused. So I can use this channel as a path to transmit the composite video signal by simply connecting a wire from the output of the RF modulator's composite video to the unused pin. In 1982, the Commodore 64 was released, and it was an extraordinary success. However, in the same year, only in Japan, together with the C64, the Commodore Max was released, a computer with the same sound and video chip. Designed by the engineer Yashi Terakura, the Commodore Max uses new chips that will later become a primary piece for the C64, such as the 6510, the SID and the VIC-2. The Commodore Max was also planned to be distributed in the United States as the Ultimax, and in Germany as the VC-10. The Commodore Max was primarily a video game console due to its hardware limitation, such as a membrane keyboard and only 2 kilobytes of memory. In regards to the memory, during the development of the Commodore Max, the software group wanted 8 kilobytes, while the company management preferred to limit themselves to 4 kilobytes to keep the costs low. Drag Terminal opted for 6 kilobytes as a compromise, even if it wasn't an ideal solution for both parties. But in the end, only 2 kilobytes were used. We don't know the precise motivation behind this decision, perhaps adopted to further reduce production costs. Due to the limited memory, the membrane keyboard and the strong competition from the various computer manufacturers in Japan, sales were very low, and within a few months Commodore decided to suspend production and sales. However, the Max project was not vain. When Commodore decided to create a successor to the VIC-20, they chose to use the same hardware as the Commodore Max, but this time increasing the memory to 64 kilobytes and inserting it into the VIC-20 case. Initially, this new design was known as the VIC-40. And just two months after the beginning of the VIC-40 project, it was presented to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, the US Electronics Fair in January 1982. This rapid development process was made possible by using much of the Max machine technology, which was already in development. Furthermore, a memory configuration was introduced in the Commodore 64 that also allowed the use of the Commodore Max game cartridges. Despite its relatively limited impact on the market, the Commodore Max continues to be a coveted collector's item. Its short but significant history remains an important chapter in the evolution of computers. This is my friend's Commodore Max, and I'll open it with grey care since I absolutely don't want to damage it. The box is slightly damaged, but I hope everything inside is intact. Inside, there's also the power supply and the antenna cable, and the Commodore Max seems to be in good conditions at first glance. However, on the back, you can see how the cables have bent the plastic over time. But now, let's see what's like inside. I'll open it gently, remembering that on the right side, there's the ribbon cable. As you can see, this is the A version, the older one. The inside still seems to be in excellent condition and not too dusty. I'll use the unused audio pin to transmit the composite video signal. I won't use this port for video, but directly the audio one to connect it to the monitor. 
As mentioned, in this case, the modification is quite simple. I just need to connect two pins with a cable, while in version B, the newer one, I would have to cut a trace or remove a capacitor C74, which in this case is not even present. So I'll connect the unused audio pin, the one on the far right, to connect it to the rightmost pin of this block of four pins. In version B, I will have to cut a piece of the track in this area, because in that model, both pins are in use. At this point, I add solder to the two pins I need to connect and create a path to transmit the video signal with a copper cable. Before I start, I would like to emphasize that this video, like others on my channel, is the result of my personal experience and it's not intended to teach how to repair these devices. I'm glad to have the older version since I really wouldn't want to remove the capacitor because it wouldn't have the same look anymore and it would be even worse to cut a piece of the track given the cost of the Commodore Max and considering that it's not even mine. This way it's also much more easily reversible. I'm also going to clean it with isopropyl alcohol to remove the flux I used. Although the rest of the board was very clean and I put it back together to test if the modification works. Given that I'm connecting not to the video port, but to the audio, I need a jack to RCA cable. Not having one available, I'll simply make it by connecting the two RCA cables to an audio jack connector. And now it's time to test everything. I obviously use a transformer to convert the power from 220 to 100 volts. Fortunately, there are no problems. I'm using a cassette for the mini basic and everything seems to work correctly. The keys all work, although with the membrane keyboard it's not very easy to use. At this point I'll also try this game. This cartridge is for the Commodore Max, but since the Max game should be compatible with the C64, I'll test the same game later on my Commodore 64. Although it's not very easy to play with this type of keyboard, everything works as it should. There were two versions of BASIC for the Commodore Max. The Mini BASIC, where you only had 500 bytes of memory available, while there was also the Commodore Max BASIC, that gave you the full 2 kilobytes. In addition to using the cartridges, the only alternative method to load something into the Max would have been through the cassette port, like in other Commodores. However, it wouldn't be very practical since there wasn't too much to do with only 2 kilobytes of memory. In the end, it works on the C64 as well. This time the modification to be made was very easy, and I returned the computer to my friend who can finally use it. As mentioned before, this project is for the Rev A version. For the newer version, Rev B, additional modifications are required. I'll leave the link to the project in the description, and if you have any questions or suggestions, please leave them in the comments. See you on the next video!